Hello, my name's Mark Henser. I'm Head of Geography and Research Lead at Heathfield Community College. I'm also the author of Making Every Geography Lesson Count and Teach Like Nobody's Watching. Um, and I'm a test columnist as well, and I occasionally do things like this, um, but usually in a room in front of people, and I find it very, very odd not being on the stage. Uh, so bear with me and we'll see how this goes. Um, today, I'd like to talk about um, the idea of powerful knowledge. So taking some of the ideas of people like Michael Young uh, and Young and Muller's work in 2010 um, and looking at how we apply that in the classroom and how we take those um, ideas and put them in place as teachers and what they might mean to us. Um, really at its heart, um, I'm thinking about how education helps people to see the world differently. And I think that's the power of education. Um, certainly when I think about it in terms of my own subject of, of geography, I, I always come back to this idea of standing at the top of a mountain, looking out across a landscape and the fact that a geographical education allows you to make sense of what you're seeing uh, and to see the world in a way that a non-geographer wouldn't. And that's what my geographical education allows me to do. That's the superpower that it gives me. And the same will be true of other subjects. Um, even ones not as good as geography, like the rest of them. So you know, with English, if you have an education in English literature, you read a text differently. You see it in a different way. You encounter it in a different way. Our education shapes us. It shapes what we can do. And that's its power. Um, and a lot of it comes back to, I suppose, ideas of, of purpose of education. Uh, this is uh, originally uh, something created by Eleanor Rawling in 2001, but uh, what we're seeing here was put together by Richard Bustin in uh, the Teaching Geography, uh, the Journal of uh, the Geographical Association a couple of years ago. And I'll leave this up uh, for a moment. Um, I think it's interesting. Have a look at the ideological tradition and their characteristics and just take a moment to think about where you would be. What do you see? as being the purpose of education. So, so I'll leave it up for a minute or two, so hopefully you can have a look and have a think. Hello. Uh, There's probably a more high tech way of doing that, wasn't there? But beyond me. Um, so hopefully you've had a little bit of a look and a bit of a think uh, and maybe worked out where you would be. I mean, personally, I'd be a liberal humanist, uh, according to that, although I think I've probably got some radical tendencies in there, though I may be kidding myself. Um, but that's kind of where I, I would put myself. You know, I think that um, Knowledge is a preparation for life. We're passing on that cultural heritage from one generation to another. And I like those kind of those big ideas, the intellectual challenge. That, that's where um, I would pitch myself. Um, the reason I think it matters is that it affects our curriculum and it affects our pedagogy, our way of delivering our curriculum, our way of teaching. And if you uh, saw your uh, view of um, you know, the purpose of education simply as being that kind of utilitarianism, and it's about getting a job, then that's what you're going to emphasise in your curriculum. You're going to put things in that enable people to um, be employable. So you'd be putting in lots of those kind of uh, transferable skills and things, but also the kind of geographical knowledge would have to be very utilitarian, have to have a purpose, that kind of geography of maps, of knowing where places are, of being able to plot routes between different things, using an ordnance survey map and things like that. It's a very utilitarian uh, purpose to education. If, on the other hand, you uh, have that kind of progressive, child-centred education, then maybe the content wouldn't matter as much. You'd be less concerned about what geography pupils were learning and would simply be looking at the fact they were learning, the process of learning, how they were creating knowledge for themselves, um, doing lots of the kind of the uh, inquiry approach 
to geography and, and focusing on the approach rather than the outcome. It would change your curriculum. It would change the way that you, you went about teaching. And I think one thing that's quite an interesting uh, activity is to share this with a department and get everyone to work out where they would be and to see if you've got that kind of alignment as a department. Because if you haven't, you might find it quite difficult to work together, putting together lessons, schemes of work, because you're all aiming for something slightly different. Um, so I, I think that's kind of a, a, a useful task and kind of have a little bit of a look at that. Uh, we can kind of simplify it down slightly and look at it in terms of Michael Young's different futures for education and some of these kind of then get put together under these futures. So uh, Michael Young uh, suggested that there were three uh, ways of seeing knowledge in the curriculum and that we've seen these different um, perspectives on knowledge in the curriculum over time. So a future one, the kind of pre-1970s, I suppose, a view of knowledge in the curriculum is that knowledge was fixed and uncontested. And there was a body of knowledge which it was possible to simply transmit from the teacher to the pupil. They, you know, you had something which was uh, known, a truth that you were giving to them so that they would then know it to be true. And it was as simple as that. That, that uh, knowledge was kind of created by academics and could then be passed on uh, to our pupils. Um, this moved on um, after the kind of the 1970s, really, the, the much, much uh, older heritage going back well into kind of the, the 19th century. But a kind of a future two perspective took off in state education, really, kind of 1970s onwards, where uh, knowledge is seen as something much more problematic, that knowledge is always relative, that, that it's created by society. And in the case of things like uh, radical constructivism from uh, Glasserford, that it's created by the individual, that there is no objective truth. So you can't have a future one approach where there is a truth that the teacher is passing on to the pupil because everyone's truth is different. Everyone is constructing knowledge for themselves in their own heads. You can't then pass that on. There is no transmission that's possible. There is no objective truth. So the teacher stops really being a teacher, certainly can't instruct anymore, can't deliver. Instead, they're a facilitator. They are helping the pupil to create their own knowledge in their own head, to make their own meaning. They are that guide on the side rather than that sage on the stage. Um, it's interesting, though, when you look at uh, this in a little bit more depth, you look at the root of some of these ideas. Um, Excellent book, uh, Kieran Egan, uh, uh, getting it wrong from the beginning, looking at the history of progressive education uh, uh, from the point of view of a of a uh, self declared progressive. Um, he looks at things like uh, Rousseau's views on education, and, and you see then this kind of arch progressive, this kind of creator of some of these romantic ideals about education, this uh, uh, teacher and their pupil out in the middle of nowhere and tutoring this child as they grow up allowing them to guide their own learning and things. But they really are um, led by the nose. You know, Rousseau creates these situations or the, the, the character creates these these situations for his student to arrive at certain fairly well predetermined ideas of what he thinks that the pupil should know and understand. So actually, when you when you start to unpick it and you, you unpick this kind of radical constructivism, there's still a, a lot of guidance to the point where it starts to seem a lot like instruction. Um, but we've, we've just got this kind of conflict, I suppose. So we've got this future one, we've got this future two. Future one, as I say, this kind of transmission model and future two, this idea that people are constructing their own knowledge. And this is the tension that we find in education still and these debates that rage between traditionalists and progressives. Future one, future two, it affects how you see the curriculum, the purpose of education. It affects your pedagogy, how you approach actually teaching. What uh, Michael Young suggests, though, is that we can move uh, beyond that into a future three. And future three goes beyond future one and future two. It's, it, we could see it as combining elements of both, uh, but it's certainly the sum is greater uh, than its parts. So in future three, knowledge is uh, produced by academic uh, disciplines, much like in uh, future one, that there, there is um, a, a great sense of objective truth. It isn't all relative. It isn't a simple case that everyone's idea is as relevant as anyone else is. And there's no such thing as a as an objective fact. There are some things which are objectively true, but 
these are contested. They're contested in these academic disciplines, but they're not held up as absolutes. They are there to be debated and picked apart and looked at and improved on and transformed. That's what happens to knowledge. So the role of the teacher then is to select the knowledge that's going to be the most powerful for pupils and to recontextualize it to make it accessible to them. So we then start to get this idea of powerful knowledge. Uh, a fantastic book there you can see, uh, Richard Buston, if you're a geography teacher, uh, if you're not a geography teacher, it's still a fascinating read, but certainly for a geography teacher, you can get hold of it. Um, it is a superb exploration of these issues. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Um, but we, we kind of have this idea then of, of powerful knowledge. Uh, and Michael Young, I mean, a lot of people listening to this, I'm sure will already be aware of his kind of his, his story um, of an educator um, in the 60s and 70s, very much part of that future to movement, uh, very concerned that the knowledge being taught in schools was the knowledge of the powerful and that all we were doing is forcing pupils to uh, believe that their truth wasn't important. They had to accept the truth of the powerful in society because that's what schools were pushing on them. What he came to realise over the years, I think, is that this was going to happen anyway. This, this knowledge the powerful had was in part making them powerful. And all we were really doing was withholding this powerful knowledge from other pupils because they weren't powerful enough to have it. And there was an injustice in that. And so powerful knowledge is knowledge that is transformative. It is knowledge that allows pupils to see the world differently, that takes them beyond their own experiences. So knowledge in the future school, Michael Young and David Lambert, um, is again, fascinating uh, book and the, the exploration of the issues. Uh, good to see uh, David Lambert, a geographer, uh, leading the way on this as well. Um, and this is kind of how they defined powerful knowledge. These are the kind of characteristics of powerful knowledge. So it's specialised. It's created and argued over within academic discipline. It, it, it doesn't really work as well if it, when you try and take it out of subjects and turn them into kind of transferable skills, transferable knowledge. They exist within these kind of boundaries that academic disciplines create, because that's how we create knowledge. We create them in these academic disciplines. Geographers do geography, create geographical knowledge, which is different from scientific knowledge, which is different from historical knowledge, which is different from the knowledge created by people studying literature. They exist within those boundaries. Powerful knowledge is also the best knowledge available within the disciplines at that time. And this is where you get that obviously the debate about well, what is the best, you know, Matthew Arnold, the best that's been thought and said in the world is always going to be controversial, but that's not a bad thing. It is contested. It should be contested, but it is not simply everyday knowledge. When I started teaching, there was a real focus on everyday knowledge. That because we were so wary of transmission of this idea that we knew more and we were passing on our knowledge to the next generation, that that problematic uh, power relationship between teacher and student, we instead tried to base everything on what they already knew. You know, we'll study the geography of their local area, the geography of their experience, the geography of their interests. But that meant we weren't moving pupils beyond their everyday knowledge. You know, everyday knowledge might be a fantastic starting point for them to then be able to move on beyond that, but it can't be the end. Powerful knowledge also needs subject specialists to teach it. It becomes a rationale for subject based curriculum. A, a geographer is needed to teach the powerful geographical knowledge. They need that disciplinary understanding of how geography works in order to teach it. So this is what we mean by powerful knowledge. These are some of its characteristics that we uh, want to be uh, concerned with. Um, we also perhaps have to consider um, why these things then are important, why it matters. As I said, you know, uh, Michael Young's uh, realization that by focusing on the everyday knowledge and the people's own experiences, we were robbing them of that chance to move beyond them and to access things that the powerful took for granted. And we see that a little bit in uh, the writing of Hirsch, who many people would put very firmly in a future one perspective on curriculum of, of a kind of a body of facts that can simply be transmitted to the next generation. These kind of famous lists of what every American needs to know. But uh, if you look at uh, some of his work, um, he was looking at what happened in France 
uh, when the French curriculum changes, they had changed. They had a real concern that they were simply teaching the knowledge of the powerful and they uh, their kind of principles of egalitarianism. That was a concern. And so they removed this kind of common core curriculum that was delivered to all pupils and replaced it with much more of the kind of uh, soft skills, uh, community based education around that everyday knowledge in those particular areas. And so removing that kind of powerful knowledge viewing it as the knowledge of the powerful and replacing it with something else. And all that happened, at least according to uh, Hirsch, is the gap widened between the advantaged and the disadvantaged. The powerful continue to access that powerful curriculum through their parents, their experiences, through private education. They continue to get that powerful knowledge and so they suffered less from the decline in education than the disadvantaged who went backwards, that they perform much less well on any kind of uh, standard. Uh, way we might try and kind of measure educational outcomes, the gap widened. And so what powerful knowledge does, if we see an entitlement to powerful knowledge, is it means we say, well, everyone should have access to this transformative education. Margaret Roberts, a geographer, is interesting in this one as well. She, she argues that a powerful knowledge also needs a powerful pedagogy. And that it isn't enough to simply identify, as Hirsch does, powerful knowledge, or as Hirsch does, just knowledge that should be uh, transmitted. But instead, we need to also then encourage that uh, contesting of knowledge. We need to teach them the disciplinary skills to question and challenge how knowledge is created, you know, who chooses which knowledge is being passed on? How was that knowledge formed in the first place? What value judgments were inherent in, in this um, process? And that we need to teach that as well, that that kind of disciplinary knowledge is just as important as the uh, substantive knowledge, the facts, the figures, the information that we're trying to uh, give to our next generation, which I think is a, a really important point. And you can perhaps see that um, here. So one thing that we often do in geography and we've done uh, uh, over the years is kind of really focused on this inquiry approach to geography, something that Margaret Roberts has always encouraged uh, through her writing. Uh, and so uh, one thing we'd be encouraged to do is to show an image like this, perhaps at the start of a lesson, start of a topic and ask pupils to come up with some questions that they would want to ask about this image and to see what they could come up with. So uh, if we have a little look, I mean, what would you ask about this? What would you want to know? I mean, ideally here, I'd then ask people to raise their hands and I'd get a few ideas from the room. Um, that's not going to work, is it? Modern technology, eh? Um, so we can't do that. Um, but let's have a think. So what might uh, a kind of, you know, I might do this with a, with a class of pupils, maybe um, year 10. What could they ask? I mean, they're going to, what's the lady doing sitting there? Uh, what are those buildings? Are they their houses? Uh, they might be able to sell those if those are houses. It looks like quite a poor country. Where is this? Um, they might be able to ask, you know, is that a natural lake or a man-made lake? It's likely to be about it, isn't it? Yeah. Unless they've got a lot of knowledge behind it, they can't really inquire. And this is where I think powerful knowledge comes in. It gives us the ability to inquire. It gives us the ability to think and to pick things apart and to look at things more deeply. So for instance, if you knew that this was in Lesotho, Perhaps that allows you to um, ask some more questions, but only if you know where that country is. If you knew that it was a kingdom uh, surrounded by South Africa, maybe that would allow you to ask some different questions. If you knew that Lesotho was a significantly poorer country than South Africa, or if you knew that Lesotho was a mountainous country um, to the east, or the kind of mountains that run through the east of South Africa, it was a kind of kingdom up in those mountains. If you knew the way the weather systems operated in that area and that rain came up over the mountains, if you knew how relief rainfall operated, that might enable you to pose a few more questions to see this a bit more deeply about maybe why they have water. If you knew that South Africa was a highly industrialised country with uh, industrial agricultural systems that were very water intensive, now you might have some more uh, uh, questions and things you'd want to know about. You know, who is that water for? And if you knew that South Africa had actually funded the building of these reservoirs, which is what we're looking at up in Lesotho, and that the water was being transferred to uh, South Africa, 
that might pose some questions about the kind of power relationships in the region. If you also knew that uh, Lesotho suffered a drought this year, maybe that would pose some more questions about the impact then this had had on the people. But it's based on you having that knowledge. If you don't know about relief rainfall, you don't know about the location of some of these countries, you don't know about the difference in development between rich and poor countries, then you can't inquire about that. You need that knowledge first in order to inquire. To do the discipline, you have to have the knowledge. Um, so this knowledge is kind of what we think with. If we don't have that powerful knowledge, we can't engage in the world around us. That image would mean very little to someone without that knowledge behind them. So this is why I think powerful knowledge is important. I think it enables our pupils to engage with the world differently, to see the world differently and to um, enact with the world in, in a very, very different way. But there have been barriers to achieving this kind of powerful curriculum, I think. That's what I'd like to look at uh, for this next part. I think these kind of four things in particular have been uh, real issues uh, for us in education, and, uh, certainly in geography, and I, and I see it more widely as well. And we'll kind of look through each one in turn. So I think the first thing that's been a bit of a barrier is the way that we've often sequenced things in geography. And this is a programme of study from a school that I taught in uh, years ago, a kind of key stage three programme of study. Uh, it looks very, very typical. You know, I go into quite a few schools and, and still most programmes of study look a lot like this. Um, there's nothing there that's particularly unusual. Six topics a year because we have six terms. Schools often had assessments at the end of each half term. So you had to finish a topic so you could do the assessment. Um, so that's why it's broken up in that way. It doesn't make much um, inherent sense, though, does it? Because some topics you think would need more time than others. Um, in terms of different lengths, doesn't really uh, work. And you can see some things as well, you know, they look at Uganda in term three of year seven, but they don't look at development until term two of year eight. It's odd way around to do it. In this case, it's been kind of outside factors that have created this. Uh, the school uh, had links to a, a school in Uganda, as weirdly a lot of schools seem to now. I don't know why Uganda in particular, probably should as a geographer, we need to look into that, <laughs> but there was something. That, that led to lots of schools having these links to, to uh, Uganda. And so the, the uh, uh, senior leadership team asked geography to study Uganda in year seven as part of this uh, kind of project with their schools in Uganda. So it's kind of put in there, but before they've looked at development more widely. Now, it could be they're looking at Uganda in a way that has nothing to do with development. You know, many things you could study about Uganda, but it seems unlikely, doesn't it? And actually, you know, I know that's not the case. They were very much looking at Uganda in terms of development, but haven't looked at other issues too with development. It's just a little bit odd. There's a few other things in there as well. Um, so they look at uh, globalisation before looking at issues around migration, before looking at um, sustainable fashion even. Seems an odd way around to do it. Um, there's just kind of a few things that don't quite make sense. And why would they be in that order? Why do weather and climate at the end of year seven, climate change at the end of year eight? It seem quite natural to move from one into the other, be a more natural sequence to build up that kind of that web of knowledge, to build up that schema about our subject. So the sequencing is just a bit odd, but it's not unusual. I don't think we've, we've often given quite enough thought to the sequencing of our, of our programme study. And in part, that's because of this future to approach where the content wasn't seen as especially important. What was important is that they were learning something. And how they went about learning it was more important. I mean, it was going to be based on their everyday knowledge anyway. We weren't trying to transmit anything, so it doesn't matter. You could take these topics, scatter them in any particular order. Who cares? It doesn't matter because the content isn't important. The knowledge isn't important. Remembering this, using it, building on it isn't important if you see it in a future two perspective. So the sequencing has often stayed um, perhaps less well thought through than it should have been. I also think we had an issue with the role of knowledge. If you think about the word knowledge and the images that it often conjures up, it's often things like that, isn't it? You know, rote learning, drill and kill, a culture of testing, way in the pig doesn't make it grow. Knowledge has an image problem that we haven't always shaken as a profession. And those of us who perhaps spend our days on Twitter debating how amazing knowledge is and things, we might have done. We might have gone, yay, knowledge. Woohoo, you know, we love memories. Thanks for that education. School's great, but most people haven't. There's still kind of, you know, lots of people arguing that what you learn in school doesn't matter because they can't remember it. 
You now that that kind of debate keeps on reoccurring. Now I don't remember what I learned in year six, so why are we bothering to insist they learn it and remember it? It's because we have this kind of fundamental misunderstanding about the nature of knowledge and memory. So we should be able to recall when we learn absolutely everything. Otherwise, it, it, it wasn't important. Now, I don't know when I first learned about earthquakes. I, I don't know who first taught me what causes them, why they have the impact they do. P waves and S waves, and surface waves. And I don't know. Someone at some point taught me those things and it's just kind of entered my web of knowledge. When someone says earthquake to me, it conjures up a thousand images, a thousand other words about that topic. But I don't know where it started. I saw um, Andy Tharby give a talk once and someone asked this question about, um, you know, people don't remember things. So what's the point? And his kind of point was, well, who taught you about cushions? Imagine all of us know what a cushion is. Most of us could probably picture a cushion. Um, most of us, I suspect, can use the term cushion in various contexts. We could talk about cushioning a blow, for instance, and we'd know what that meant. But we couldn't isolate the episodic memory where someone sat us down and goes, right, I'm not going to teach you about cushion. Here's a cushion. Here are the various ways that you can use the phrase cushion. They're, they're semantic memories, not episodic ones. Claire Seeley writes beautifully about this. And the importance of semantic memories is that they do transfer to lots of different contexts. It's why semantic memories are important, whereas episodic memories are very much linked to that episode. They're linked to that time. You know, we've, we've still got within our profession and within our wider society a misunderstanding about what education is, what knowledge is, and how, what memory is. We, we don't fully appreciate some of these complexities, I don't think. Another issue we see, uh, particularly in geography, although I think we see it elsewhere, is what I would term the citizenshipification of our subjects. Now, citizenship might be an incredibly important, relevant subject in its own right. Fine. Then it's a perfectly relevant subject in its own right. It doesn't need to enter every other subject. But increasingly, uh, subjects are becoming issues based. As though that's the whole purpose of studying it is to change the world. I worry a little bit that as teachers, we can sometimes have a bit of a hero complex. You know, I've got to make my class no longer use single use plastic. I've got to make my class take climate change seriously. I've got to make my class. I don't. That's not my role as a teacher. My role as a teacher is to uh, give pupils access to the powerful knowledge with which they may well make those decisions because they're the logical conclusions from that powerful knowledge. If you know what single use plastic does and the issues with it um, when it's used inappropriately and so on, then you are likely to make, hopefully, these better decisions. I think one of the issues we have with this citizenshipification of education is that it lets the real culprits off the hook. If we just say uh, the schools are responsible for changing the world, schools should do it by teaching the next generation to behave in a more responsible way, then it means no one has to behave in a more responsible way now. You know, we failed the last generation. They weren't taught enough about climate change. We can't blame them for the way that they're behaving. It's down to schools to, to shape the future. No, no, it's not. It's up to people now to change their behavior. It's up to the powerful now to change things. And we need to put pressure on them to change things, not allow schools to become a scapegoat. And of course, it isn't just things like climate change, environmental issues. We see it in things like you know, county lines and knife crime and whatever the kind of uh, media obsession at the moment is. I'm amazed we haven't been blamed for the coronavirus yet. No, I am recording this um, on, a, on a Wednesday morning. So God knows by Thursday afternoon, I suspect there'll be an article somewhere saying it's all schools fault. Um, but, you know, it's a huge issue where we stop teaching uh, powerful knowledge and instead we just focused on teaching issues. Um, it's a problem, I think. And it's led to us not maybe teaching powerful knowledge because instead we've been teaching these issues. Uh, a kind of another issue uh, that's maybe um, held us back a little bit is we've taken our eye off disciplinary thinking a little bit. And probably since the uh, the kind of the knowledge turn, actually, which has allowed us to consider powerful knowledge more, a lot of it over the last 10 years has focused very much on substantive knowledge. And I can see the reason why I think we, we genuinely did not teach substantive knowledge as often as well, as thoroughly as perhaps we should have done in the past, because we were so concerned with this future to view and these, these kind of a problematic nature of knowledge. So I can understand why we, uh, many of us, embraced substantive knowledge um, so wholeheartedly. But we need to remember the disciplinary knowledge as well, if knowledge is going to be powerful. We do also need to teach how knowledge is created in our disciplines. What does it mean to think 
like a geographer, to create geographical knowledge, um, to teach the process of inquiry so they can use the substantive knowledge that they've gained. These things are important as well. Um, and so, you know, in geography, I know an example, you know, they remove controlled assessments from GCSE for many, many reasons, many of them perfectly valid, and replace them with a tiny, tiny portion of, of the exam where they're examined on field work that they did. Uh, but the um, problem here is that what it's uh, resulting is lots of schools and lots of geography departments not focusing on though that field work anymore, that process of doing geography, of going out, collecting data to test a hypothesis, to uh, present and analyze the data, you know, to go through that process of doing geography, it, it kind of, you know, increasingly schools I see going, well, well, we'll just kind of talk pupils through the process. Maybe we'll do the field work, maybe we won't. We can just kind of explain to them how to answer these fairly predictable questions. You can't blame schools for it, really, because pressure and accountability is so high. Why would you spend weeks? That's what it takes, weeks doing geography when that's not really how you're going to be held to account. You're going to be held to account for getting them through the exam, which focuses much more on the substantive knowledge. So there's an issue. Uh, where do we put this disciplinary knowledge? You know, that overcrowded curriculum, it needs space, it needs time to do it. I certainly haven't uh, managed to, to fully... Uh, get an answer to that yet. Yeah, it's something that, that we certainly still struggle with and that I'm still working on. Um, but it, it is an issue, I think, that we're maybe we're not always focusing on when we think about powerful knowledge. Um, okay, so this next bit I, I've talked about in Research Ed uh, talks before. I, I just want to kind of look through it through the lens of powerful knowledge. So how do we create a powerful curriculum? Well, I say first off, it starts with our intent. I think it's a pity that intent is now being done for Ofsted. As with anything, when it's done for Ofsted, it tends to be a bit of an issue. But we do need to know why we're asking people to study what they're studying. It matters. Um, I think that when we think about um, our intent, we need to think of what makes our subject unique. You know, schools can do many, many things. They can act as social workers. They can play a role in developing the whole pupil of raising people, of making them ethical beings, of developing their character, of doing all of these other things. But so can lots of other agents in society. They can also play a role in this. What can schools uniquely do that nobody else really can? And that is passing on this powerful knowledge because it needs subject specialists. No one else is going to be passing on powerful knowledge in geography, science, maths, RE, history, English. You know, no one else is doing that for our pupils but us. We are the only ones who can do it. So I think when we think about our intent, then we want to think, OK, yes, we can do all of those other things as well. But what is society relying on us to do? What can no one else do? What is uniquely ours that we're offering to society? So this is our kind of uh, very brief kind of intent for geography in our school. This is what we are trying to do. And once we've got the intent, then we can go on to our second step, which is then to say, okay, well, what is the powerful knowledge that people need for that intent to be realized? What is the fundamental knowledge? What do we count as the best available knowledge in our subject at the moment? Now that's difficult, isn't it? You know, for many of us, our degrees were, were a long, long time ago. You know, I'm nearly 20 years out now from my degree. Things have moved on. I need to stay in touch with my uh, subject associations. You know, I need to look at what uh, the Geographical Association, the Royal Geographical Society are producing through their journals, keeping up with, with uh, developments in my subject. And the same is true of all of us in all of our subjects. If we're going to know what the best knowledge is. We also probably want to think about what we really expect pupils to know in, say, six months or a year or 10 years. Now, what is that absolute fundamental knowledge we want them to have as semantic memories? Not that I remember that lesson, but they are going to know. You know I think it's important that pupils know um, what causes earthquakes as a kind of semantic memory. You know, so when they see an earthquake uh, story on the news, they can go, oh, OK, that was caused by that not by these other things. You know, pe people still often get these kind of really weird misconceptions of what causes uh, various uh, hazards and the role that people might play and things like that. It's often an assumption that there's a human cause for any kind of uh, hazard. And to know that, no, actually with earthquakes, the, the fundamental cause of why there was an earthquake 
wasn't. What then happens might have been the kind of the impact that it had uh, that might well be. But this is that kind of powerful knowledge. I want them to be able to have that discussion internally to understand these things when they're seeing it unfold in the news. That's the fundamental knowledge. But then there's also the facilitating knowledge, as Christine Council puts it, the knowledge they need to have at the moment to grasp the fundamental knowledge. Now, at the moment in the classroom, I want them to know what the death toll was in the Nepal earthquake to contrast it to Italy so they can reach those conclusions about the differences between earthquakes in uh, wealthy and less wealthy countries. That's facilitating knowledge. I don't need them in 10 years time to remember the death toll of the Nepal earthquake. Now, that's just facilitated the development of these semantic memories. I also need to consider the threshold concept. So uh, Meyer and Land, 2004, uh, threshold concepts and troublesome knowledge came up with this idea that there were certain barriers to pupils making more progress. If they hadn't understood something fully, they couldn't understand things that came later. So things like sustainability in geography. If you haven't grasped that concept, other things aren't going to make sense. If you think sustainability is just about the environment, you haven't considered economic and social issues in terms of sustainability, other things won't make sense. It's a threshold concept. I also need to, especially in geography, consider places that we're going to study. You know, what best typifies the things that we're going to look at? Which places in the world are going to be most powerful in terms of pupil understanding in the future? And this is difficult. You know, this is where we get into the kind of realms of futurology. You know, I'm trying to look at the world now and think, OK, well, you know, I think East Africa is going to be a highly significant place in the future due to its uh, rapid changes in terms of development, but also the environmental problems that they're facing. I can see East Africa being incredibly significant um, in the future. Uh, the same for uh, the MEMA region, the Middle East and North Africa region, a highly significant people to understand what's going on in that part of the world. China, Russia, it's quite difficult to think of places that aren't going to be highly significant, uh, but that's the kind of the, the responsibility that we have. So I need to kind of have those discussions with, with my team, with our, with our subject community, you know, what places are we going to study? What's going to be most powerful for them to understand? We can then think about uh, the sequencing so the structure, and this is where we get the idea of so that, <coughs> excuse me, not the dry continuous cough. Um, so we get the idea of kind of so that, we are studying this so that, and this image here of the threads coming together, I think is a really useful one. So we have the different threads coming in to form the next topics. Those other threads, other things they've already studied, encountered that they're now bringing together to study something new. So if we take an example, uh, the flows of people in and out uh, and around the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region. That's something we study in year seven. So what are the threads coming in? What do they already need to have studied and learned and understood in order to study the flows of people in the MENA region? So maybe they need to know what inequality is. That's a major driving force. I don't want them to have to learn about inequality and all these things about the MENA region at the same time. I want them to already understand inequality. Uh, the use of development indicators, the location of continents, maybe some things about the major biomes and ecosystems, weather and climate. They need to understand that first. So that needs to come before they study the MENA region. And then we think, OK, well, those threads have now come together to make a new thread. Where does that then go? So in our case, when they look at uh, emerging economies in India, they will use some of what they've learned about the MENA region when they study that, you know, people leaving India, the Indian subcontinent to go and work in places like Dubai. Well, now let's use what you've learned there to study the impact that that's having on India, uh, and maybe how that's likely to change as India develops. You know, they're going to use what they've learned so that we study this so that you can do this, so that you can do that later on. Those words so that become really important here. And we can then start mapping the connections. I've shared this many times before. This was our kind of early map as a department where we uh, were putting out the kind of various different topics in key stage three geography and then showing how they linked up. And it's changed and developed uh, since then. Uh, this was kind of one of our, our early attempts. And so we start saying, OK, so when you study weather and climate, you're going to use some of the things you learned when you looked at comparing places. When you study Haiti, you are going to use the things you learned in tectonics, East Africa, sustainability, weather and climate. All of these things are going to come together. This is where those threads are starting to come together. We do that so that we can start building things into planning so that we can use the same places. So we know we're going to study Haiti later on. So let's use Haiti as an example in weather and climate. Let's use it as an example when they study tectonics. Let's start using those places earlier so that pupils already have a good understanding of those places when they come to do a more in-depth study later on. And the same images as well. If I need to show the impact of an earthquake early on in year eight, let's pick the earthquake that hit Haiti and use that image 
um, earlier. And hopefully then when they come to Haiti, they will see that image again, remember what they studied um, back then. They'll actually use that kind of episodic memory. Uh, knowledge organizers and retrieval quizzes as well. I mean, I think we do have a slight issue um, where these things are becoming what we mean by a knowledge rich curriculum and that if we have those things, then we must be teaching powerful knowledge. We're not. Um, they can be useful. And so when we design knowledge organizers, we can make sure we're putting in links to previous topics. When we're using retrieval quizzing, we can make sure we're quizzing on previous topics that they're about to use now. So we can use, say, a quiz about to look at Russia. So let's now um, put in some questions about uh, the Arctic that they learned about in year seven. Let's put some information in about sustainability they looked at in year seven into this uh, quiz at the beginning of year eight lesson to, to retrieve so they're ready to use that knowledge, to make it powerful by applying it in new situations. And then the same for assessments. And how do we assess that pupils actually have access to this powerful knowledge? Well, we can only do that by asking to apply it to something new. That's what made it powerful in the first place. So can they take what they learned about Russia and then be given some information about, say, I don't know, Canada and draw out similarities and differences? Can they take what they learned about East Africa and then have some information on South America? Can they apply some of that information to reach conclusions? Then we'll know whether they've really grasped the implications of what they've studied. Has it been powerful? Has it been transformative? Because that's really what we mean by powerful knowledge. Powerful knowledge should be transformative for pupils. It should transform the way they see the world. It should transform what they can do, what they can understand, what they can access. That's the point. That's why we have schools. That's why we have education. To make pupils more powerful. Powerful knowledge should also be powerful for teachers. It puts us back in the driving seat. There's a massive responsibility to do these things, to select the knowledge that we're going to pass on. It's a massive responsibility, but it's also a massive power. No one else can make these decisions for us. The curriculum doesn't do this. Exam specifications don't really do this. They're far too broad. We still have to recontextualize the information, put it into a form that we can pass on to our pupils. On top of that, we have all the disciplinary thinking that we have to teach. It's powerful. It matters. And we should take it seriously. Um, so thank you very much uh, for tuning in. I say my name is Mark Enser. Very easy to reach on Twitter, um, at Enser Mark. Um, or email me, mentor at heathfieldcc.co.uk. Normally now we'd have kind of questions and things. Um, I assume we'll do that via Twitter. So send me a tweet. Um, any questions, comments, thoughts, um, be nice, be kind. There's a hashtag for that. Um, and buy my books, please be nice. Uh, there's another one coming out soon, looking at uh, powerful geography. Um, so looking at uh, powerful knowledge um, in the geography curriculum. So that should be out uh, early 2021, in the middle of writing it now. So any thoughts on that? Uh, wonderful, let me have them. Um, so thank you, uh, keep safe, be well, stay indoors, etc. And I will see you on the other side. Thank you very much.